What does cancel culture say about our society? I remember the first time I heard about the, the concept. I don't know when it was, um, but I remember it had this uh, strong reaction. It brought me back viscerally to sort of my childhood experiences. Um, that, just a knee-jerk reaction. I'm not saying you have to read deeply into it, but something about it that rubbed me this way. I remember as kids, you may remember this in kindergarten, in preschool, we had the game called Musical Chairs. You know, a game, you put out chairs, and the music starts playing, and um, there are, let's say, 20 kids in the classroom, and there are 19 chairs, so not everybody's going to be able to find a chair. The objective is to make sure you get yourself a chair. I remember the, the music went on, and we started running it. In the beginning, obviously, um, it's not that difficult. The competition is not that fierce. And yeah, 19 of us got a chair, but one kid was slow, was unable, was awkward, ended up being left out. Immediately, I had this pang of feeling, you know, it's really sad. Okay, but the game went on. Now there's 18 chairs for, uh, for 19 of us. Um, and then you keep going, you keep going until you end up having uh, just one chair less and one chair less and one chair less until only one person remains. There was something about the game that struck me as being very cruel. It was, uh, I know it's not very profound trauma and uh, that requires therapy, but nevertheless, that idea of leaving someone out, almost like ostracizing someone, and for children, that can be very deep, have a deep uh, impact, because you want to be part of something, and here suddenly you're left out. And I remember as I got a little older, I, I checked out, I asked the teacher, I forgot already whom, I started saying, why do you have to play this type of game? Why not play a different type of game? You know, why does it have to be like leaving someone out? So I remember one person told me, well, all sports is like that. Two people play, the only one person can win. Yeah, but there was something here that was, seemed to be a little stronger. That was the reaction I had. You know, there are things in life where we cross a line and begin to not just disagree with someone, we begin to personalize it. And we essentially ostracize them. We want them fired from their job. We want them completely canceled from our culture. That, who has the right to make such a uh, declaration? Who has the right to do that? Whether it's from the right wing or the left wing. And I'm really here completely apolitical. I don't really care who's doing the canceling. But who has the right to cancel others? Now, I know the argument can go. One second. Like, I mean, I hear this all the time. What would you do if you were living in Nazi Germany and you see someone's a Nazi and they're speaking, you know, they're uh, spewing anti-Semitic venom that is and calling on violence? Would you not... Would you just say, okay, let's have a, a conversation, a debate, and so on? Wouldn't you want them canceled? Wouldn't, shouldn't have Hitler and his cohorts been canceled and shouldn't have been, it would have been preempted? So there, there's the argument right away thrown in my face of a Jew um, and the other such arguments. And my answer to that, of course, is, well, you know, there's one case that's not comparable to another. Um, so someone will say, why not? Doesn't that person have a right? Well, yes, freedom of speech allows you the right to say anything you wish. But I think we could come to a consensus. And now that I think about it, I know some people would argue that, that maybe there are some, uh, let's call them absolutes, something we can all agree upon, even though Nazi ideology, and I have met people who embrace Nazi ideology, I have, and are cordial about it, but they have a very strong racist uh, philosophy about life where they exclude anyone of except the pure Aryan white race, including blacks, including Jews, including homosexuals, including anyone that the gypsies, anyone that doesn't fit their uh, model. Now, do they have the right? That's a good question. Do they have the right? Yes. In this country, freedom of speech has a right, even if it's obscene, even if it's undesirable. I mean, Antonio Scalia, the, the, the late uh, Chief Justice, pointed out in one of his papers, he says there's more rights for pornography in this country than for piety. Like a free speech would come into religion, there are more fights about it than for things that are considered um, inappropriate, obscene. But that's, an, uh, that's just a comment on the side. The point I'm making here is, can we come to such an agreement? Well, maybe this touches on the big issue of moral relativism. <coughs> Excuse me. I don't know if I said anything wrong, but maybe. 
moral relativism versus absolute morality. In other words, is there such a thing as right and wrong? If there is absolute right and wrong, then obviously crossing that line really does have consequences. But even then, do we have the right to cancel someone? Well, in the case of, let's say, Nazism, you would argue, yes, because they are calling on the destruction and the violence and the hurt of other people. How could such a person be tolerated? We have to stand up to them. But what happens if it's not about violence or killing? What about if someone just has a different opinion than you? A political opinion. Maybe an opinion that you completely abhor. So who decides? That's the big question that needs to be addressed. The concern I have is that once we go across a line and say, as soon as you have a different political opinion, you love Trump, I hate Trump. You want open borders, I don't want open borders. You want higher taxes, I don't want higher taxes. Um, as soon as you go into areas that, that are not about violence or death or killing, then if we can just open that door, then in a sense we actually minimize the ability to criticize something that is, really requires criticizing, you know, the crying wolf concept, that when there's a real thing that needs to be uh, addressed, something real travesty, then it becomes, oh, it's part of another, just another opinion. That's also an issue that needs to be looked at. So the few points that I would like to talk about. Number one is what defining, not making every immoral act, in your opinion, as being equal, because that's not the case. You, what you may call inappropriate, someone else may say it's not that inappropriate. Where we can come to a consensus in this country, for example, freedom of speech, yes, but if you call violence or you're actually violent, you don't have the freedom to hurt anybody. And we've come to an agreement about that. What about racist, racist rhetoric? People talk racism against Jews or against blacks or against Asians or against any minority or against whites for that matter. So from the freedom of speech point of view, the argument goes, and of course this is an, a very complex issue, that you're entitled to say it as long as you're not calling for any type of abrogation or in any way compromising someone else's rights. But what happens if a person who has a company or a store and they say, I don't know Jews and no dogs allowed, no blacks and no dogs allowed, you know, just to give examples. And I'm not using those examples as, in, in any way as, as an exclusion of other racist discrimination. So is he entitled to do that? So, of course, this has already hit the courts. And let's say he may be entitled to say what he wants, but can he have a public forum in the sense where he has a store, or he's just obligated as a, as a store owner or as a business or a corporation? Now, is it relevant whether, he's a public com whether it's a public company or a private company? These are questions. The question, again, is also how to address it. Is canceling that person the way to go about it? And who's doing the canceling? What happens if this becomes a political weapon that has nothing to do with the morality? It's simply a way of uh, exercising clout and intimidating others. You intimidate others. Remember McCarthyism? Well, I don't remember it either. But we all know it was a very dark chapter in the end, after World War II in the 50s where people, communists, were then considered to be persona non gratis in the starkest, strongest possible way. And by the way, there also Jews were involved with it. We know about Julius and Ethel Rosenberg as and Senator McCarthy used the opportunity to begin to blacklist anyone. And it, went, it crossed many, many lines, and at some point there was a big backlash. But it caused damage, it destroyed people's reputations and lives. Is that, and he did it in the, in the guise of a legal structure. He was a senator. It was in the House, in, the house, in, in, our, in our governmental legislative body. So the question then is, who is the one that decides? We're not, we, to the point that we can disagree about different topics, understandable. But the point that someone can decide we're going to cancel someone else, that is extremely d disturbing. And what does it say about our culture? I'll tell you what it says. It says that we're unable to maturely resolve issues. I have plenty of people I disagree with. I have family members I disagree with. But when there is a foundation of love and care, I will never cancel a person, even if I totally disagree with them even if they're doing things that I find reprehensible. Now, let's say, let's just discuss what I mentioned, the extreme example, Nazism, fascism, or some other manner of that. Just a moment, please.
I put my phone on, do not disturb. I'm not sure why that happened, but I apologize. So let's talk the extreme example of something that we all find absolutely disturbing. So I'm thinking about it. Let's say I decide that here's a group of people that I find to be d- dangerous, Nazis. Can I just go ahead and say, you know what, let's, let me create a movement to cancel them out without any due process. First of all, how do I know for sure that they're that category? Even if it's, and I'm saying it as a Jew, uh, who brothers and sisters were killed merciless, mercilessly. So I look to my blueprint, which is the Torah, what do you do in a situation? So first of all, you have to establish that that person is indeed dangerous. Do you establish that yourself? Maybe you need a few objective individuals involved in it so we don't have any subjective interests. Even if you determine that's the case, is canceling the way or there may perhaps other ways? Maybe there's prosecution. Maybe there's other ways to um, create a deterrent. Now, if, for example, nothing works and a group, a body, that has objective parties, not some emotional or political or partisan interests, come to a consensus that this is the best way to deal with this person, which is sad that you need to cancel him in every possible way because of the ideas that he's propagating, he or she is propagating, and so on. If there's due process in that sense, and that becomes a a legitimate approach, I mean, look, every time you put someone in prison, you're ostracizing them. They're forever going to have a criminal record. But the only way you can do that legitimately is because there's a due process. But that's not what's happening. This has been taken to the streets. This is social media. This is bullying. So even if there is legitimate concern, and I'm talking even the worst case scenario, the mere respect of human beings is absolutely necessary. And I say this, yes, the Jewish people, specifically who suffered like no others, will say that clearly. We will never just dismiss a, a people or a group, because of their ideas and so on. Yes, there is stories about Amalek, we know about their obliteration, but they've proven to be absolute mortal enemies. People who've come, just like Nazis, who've proven themselves to be that way. And that's also with a process, not just somebody decides. So I think the first thing is we are not to take the law in our own hands. We're not God. We are not the judges of others. We are not the judges of the universe. We're not judges of any group of people. If you take that approach, and someone came to me and said, look, I want you to be part of a group who's going to review a person's behavior or words, and what do you think? And it's done in that deliberate fashion. And again, you know there are people who are objective and nonpartisan, and there's no other hidden agendas. Then we look at all options. I don't like the word cancel culture per se, but if ostracizing or in some way dismissing someone because it's the only way to get results, positive results... But let it be stated as such that we've tried many approaches and this seems to be the only one because the person will will not recant or will not refrain from saying things that are provocative, more more than provocative, saying things that can be destructive and so on. But that would be like parents and children. Imagine your child did something really horrible. Really horrible. I don't even want to spell anything out. Just use your imagination. As a parent, as a healthy parent, Not an unhealthy parent, which who either ignores it or blames somebody else. Or an unhealthy parent who just accepts um, everything and just, as I said, blames this. Or the opposite, is always punitive and looks to blame the child and demoralize the child. But a healthy parent. The approach is love dictates that you look into it, see, confirm that what actually happened, and then do something about it to teach your child, not just a lesson, for the future. Because I love you, I want you to be a better person. If I heard that coming from someone that loves me, and that includes sometimes something that may be a little harsh, I'm not saying I would like it, but at least it has a basis that we can talk about and defend. Never, ever do we invalidate a human being. You can invalidate their behavior. The statement in the Talmud, I think, is so relevant here. May their sins be erased, but not the sinners. May the sins be erased, but not the sinners. It's not about the person, it's about the behavior. So number one, you've immediately eliminated the personalization of it. You're not here to take away that person's chair, take away their significance, because it's not ours to take. Birth is God saying you matter. Every human being has indispensable value. Yes, we can hurt ourselves and hurt others, and we cannot forfeit our indispensable value, but we can forfeit our right to exercise it if we become hurtful to others. 
This is the whole basis of law and, law and order and justice for crimes. If somebody has been proven to be hurtful to another and they cannot control themselves, there's no other way but to keep them out of, uh, harm, out of uh, keep others out of their harm's way so that you have to do whatever you have to do. But the idea of creating a community and a group, which is so much part of the polarization of this country, that we can just absolutely dismiss because we don't like someone's opinions, and it's usually political opinions, not necessarily ones that you can even say are absolutes. Yeah, you're totally entitled to a certain position, but to completely dismiss another position, and not only dismiss it to the point that the person who has that position deserves to be ostracized, deserves to be blacklisted, that's unacceptable, period. These are some of the thoughts I have, but I want to go a little more about how it reflects us and upon us. I see this in every community, religious communities included. There's an element, whether it's subtle or overt, of blacklisting people. Because the community wants to have its control, wants to uphold its standards, it sees a threat as a threat anyone that disrupts or defies or questions authority. So one of the ways is this subtle punishment. Every society, every culture has elements of this. And maybe in religious communities it may be stronger because of their beliefs are stronger. But every community does it. This is whether it was Victorian culture or it was different cultures throughout history, you'll always find this. It's a, mat, it's a subject of novels, of films, of poetry, that element. And it's a subtle way of control. That absolutely is also not acceptable. Let me state it for the record. Even if it's done in the name of God, we are not judges. Only God has a right to make these decisions. Now, people will say, well, I'm speaking in the name of God, or I'm using the Bible, or the Torah, or some other authoritative text. Yeah, you can say whatever you like, but no one gave you that right, because you're subjective and so on. Now, is there a system of, uh, of accountability? Of course, that's called law and order. And there's, a, as I said, due process and witnesses and evidence and objective people sitting in, the, in sitting in judgment. I don't even like the word judgment, but sitting and evaluating the situation. So that's that. But that idea is also part of the conformity that many people feel they need for security. It, doesn't, it undermines the dignity of the individuality of every one of us as individuals. And that's why I find this cancel culture so much part of that same history of blacklisting, of subtle dismissal, suddenly not invited to a party, you're not, al you're not allowed in, you will be punished because you broke the rules of our culture. Now, when a person breaks the rules of culture, number one, we have to determine whether it's a cultural thing and not a control issue. And even then, as I said, there are ways to do it with gentleness, with love, with kindness. And I'm not suggesting being naive and looking the other way and, and, never, and never, never taking any aggressive approaches when necessary. When necessary and only in the measure necessary. And never by someone who's angry or emotionally involved or subjective or in any other way prejudiced or biased. So there's, these are some of my thoughts, my friends, on this topic. I always like to conclude with something positive. What's the positive? The positive is that whoever you are, and whatever your opinions are, I am your friend, and I love you. And I don't say that flippantly, like, you know, it's like I love everybody. I may not love your opinions, but I like to hear about them, because I believe fundamentally that you have a right to exist, and you have a right to be who you are, and you know what? We all should educate each other. If I have an opinion you may not like, I'm happy to hear your thoughts. I may agree, I may disagree. I may be subjective. We all have our blind spots. But we should be able to have a meaningful dialogue. We should be able to have a conversation. A conversation that even if it gets heavy or even if it gets impassioned, which is fine, but it's a conversation that is not invalidating and dismissing another person. Now, what about, you'll say, a person that does have opinions that you say, oh, this person is just closed-minded, no one to talk to? You know, even that, you can come to that conclusion. That doesn't mean you have to announce it or advertise it. You know, there are people, I realize, that may be not worthwhile getting into a discussion on this topic. They just cannot see it another way. Now, they may say, say the same thing about me. They're entitled to do that. Well, that is why we have minds, and hopefully our minds can help us rise above our subjective hearts, and, and, and allow us to look at things in a clear-headed way. And in case where we are subjective, we ask others, and that's how we grow.
So my goal and our goal, Meaningful Life Center, MeaningfulLife.com, is to create that cross-pollination, that synergy, of uh, that harmony within diversity. And I welcome any thoughts, any ideas. Please never hesitate to even point out something that you totally disagree with. And we could have a humane uh, conversation about it. But dismissal, um, cancellation, cancellation, and so on. I want to add one more footnote. This doesn't mean that you're not entitled to cancel a subscription to a magazine or a newspaper or to cancel services you're paying for for something you don't agree with. You're not canceling them. I mean, that's their company. That's their business. If they can't satisfy their customers, that's the consequences. I'm talking about cancellation of individuals and not about uh, services or uh, programs or products that you find coming from places that you don't agree with. But on the positive note, let's go again. Let's embrace the best within each other, the beauty that each of us has, and create that grand symphony of indispensable musical notes creating beautiful music. It's always great to be speaking with you. Please share. Please like. Let's get the conversation going. Hopefully, if we can get everybody involved in such a conversation, that alone is a great beginning. And let's commit to just do that, sharing these ideas and seeing how others react and uh, taking it from there. Everyone be well and be blessed.